The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. This is the way all moral values have been inverted. So that what was once considered sinful and morally wrong is now transfigured into something right and even worthy of emulation. We see this later on in our passage on unnatural sexual relations. At the same time, what is good is, and what is of God is transformed into something that is bad. Such inversion and transformation of moral values legitimizes the repudiation of the moral canopy that comes with submission to the will of God. Such redefining efforts and the creation of alternate frameworks of thinking are regarded by the disobedient as somehow clever and wise. They congratulate themselves as being more enlightened, more in tune with the times. Haven't we heard in the media, we must be on the right side of history? Which is a euphemism for saying, let's join the bandwagon in affirming and embracing same-sex marriage. Right side of history, because history is going in this direction. And all you who hold on to a traditional view, you will be left behind. Wise in their own eyes. Regular words that have been uh, the, that have sustained civilization have now been reinvested with meaning that corresponds to an anti-God ideology. Words like marriage, family, tolerance or intolerance, freedom, justice, liberty. These words have taken on new shades of meaning today. Even the notion of gender is being contested. I read the other day, when parents request for birth certificates from the New York City Health Department, they have to fill a form, which includes a question asking whether the woman giving birth is male or female. <laughs> you would have thought, it's so obvious. You can't presume because the whole category of gender is now contested. Selective moral outrage is another example of the futility of ungodly thinking. The distinction between what is morally right and wrong is often eroded in our postmodern age. And one would think that this would mean a more relaxed and lazy, fair attitude towards matters of morality. Yet, ironically and surprisingly, there is quite a bit of moral outrage today in the public square, but outrage only directed at certain kinds of moral failings. Selective moral outreach, the largely left-leaning and progressive media is committed to promoting certain politically correct moral causes. Climate change, marriage equality, which is again euphemism for same-sex relations, pro-choice, gun control, animal rights, and so on. Anyone who does not conform to these accepted orthodoxies of political correctness will be castigated as immoral and treated as a pariah. As British philosopher Roger Scruton astutely observes, open-mindedness turns out to be no-mindedness. The absence of beliefs and the negative response to all those who have them. End of quote. I think Roger Scruton sounds an exasperated note when he writes, one by one, all the old certainties are being denounced as isms and phobias. You thought that humans are distinct from animals, then you are guilty of speciesism. You thought that there is a real and objective distinction between men and women, transphobia. You thought the, <laughs> that attitudes which lead to mass murder are suspect, Islamophobia. But one sure thing about the world in which we live is that if you believe that there are real and objective distinctions between people, you had better keep quiet about it, especially if it is true. <laughs> you can sense that frustration. Thirdly, the third manifestation is an idolatrous deifying of the created. 
When one chooses not to worship God and bow to his authority, it doesn't, take, doesn't mean that one stops worshipping. It simply means that one has substituted something else for God. God cannot be rejected without putting something else in its place. I think G.K. Chesterton is famous for saying, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. When you suppress the truth, you place yourself in a situation where you are susceptible to all sorts of alternate faiths, ideologies, and religions. And judging from the plethora of sects and faiths and ideologies on offer today, we may safely assume that there is a fair bit of suppressing of the truth. Significantly, Paul tells us in Romans 1 that one manifestation of false worship is a worship of idols that are in images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles in verse 23. In other words, some being or some object from within the created order is made into a god. How about worshipping a motorbike? In 2013, the report comes describing how residents of Chotila village in the northwest state of Rajasthan in India started worshipping a 350cc Royal Enfield bullet motorbike. Uh, I was told that uh, it's not a very good motorbike. But <laughs> My friend who is a motorcycle enthusiast told me that. The motorbike was placed within a glass box alongside a photo of the owner, Umbana, or Bullet Bana is his nickname, who died in a road accident over 20 years earlier. Uh, Worshippers would wait for long hours to pay tribute to this motorized god. And apparently every time Um's bike was taken to the local police station, it disappeared from there and reappeared somewhere else. So according to residents, the, the motorbike starts automatically or miraculously on the day and time of the owner's death. And because of that news getting around, there was this worship of a motorbike. Now some of you may think that such idolatry is limited to societies that are uninformed and uneducated. Uh, think again, you recall when Paul went to Athens in Acts 17, he was distressed by a city full of idols. And yet Athens was the center of philosophy. We read about the Epicureans and the Stoics and all these smart people in that same city, and yet coexisting with that high-powered philosophy is a rampant idol idolatry. Whenever you carve out some element or aspect of creation and you elevate that to an absolute, then that is idolatry. This tendency to absolutize some part of creation is what Dutch philosopher Herman Dojovit regards as, and I quote, the source of all isms. The source of all isms. Literary critic Terry Egerton in his book, Culture and the Death of God, tells us that the modern age has thrown up several god surrogates. The Enlightenment rationalism has made a god of reason. Romanticism has deified imagination. Materialism looks to nature as god. Marxism offers an economic version of sin and salvation. So idolatry and the manufacturing of gods, in the words of John Calvin, is something that happens when we turn and jettison divine authority. Technology is yet another area, another God surrogate. There is now a gathering interest in what is known as transhumanism, a movement that seeks to use technological means to enhance the human person. This is how philosopher and futurist Max Moore defines transhumanism. It is a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology, guided by life-promoting principles and values. I think the last part was just tacked on, just to make sure that uh, you give me some semblance of uh, uh, respectability. But it's about using technology to enhance human life. This is a kind of techno-salvation and to me, is another manifestation of the attempt at worshipping an alternate god. Fourthly, dehumanization or the destruction of the human. 
Idolatry leads to destructive behavior. The rejection of God invariably leads to the dehumanizing of people. Nancy Percy teases out the connection between idolatry and destructive behavior towards humans, and she suggests that idols always lead to a lower view of the human person. She notes, when a worldview exchanges the creator for something in creation, it will also exchange a high view of humans made in God's image for a lower view of humans made in the image of something in creation. In other words, the idolatrous deifying of any part of creation will lead to a reductionistic view of humanity. And it is but a short step from this diminished view of the person to harmful and destructive behavior. Percy goes on to say, when we define God as something instead of a someone, we will tend to treat humans as some things too. So when God is removed as a norm for human behavior, when what God thinks is disregarded, then are we surprised to find the lack of concern for the dignity of the human person? A utilitarian ethics emerges whereby people are valued if they are useful, otherwise they can be dispensed with. Sir David Attenborough, the well-known naturalist and television presenter, considers human beings to be, and I quote, a plague on the earth. For the sake of the earth, human population must be curtailed. In 2006, Professor Eric, uh, it's Pianka, not Pink, uh, autocorrect, change it. <laughs> <laughs> He's a biologist and evolutionary ecologist at the University of Texas. He was awarded a prestigious prize for being an outstanding scientist, and in his acceptance speech to the gathering of the Texas Academy of Science, he made the shocking suggestion that it would be beneficial for the planet if 90% of the world's population were wiped out by airborne Ebola. What's surprising, what's astonishing, was that at the end of his speech, Virtually every scientist, professor, college student stood to their feet to vigorously applaud the man. <laughs> Pianka hopes for a global pandemic to eradicate 90% of the world's population because to him, humans are no better than bacteria. Now, he's an expert on lizards. Now, he recounts an encounter he has with some neighbors in one of his publications. And he said, some neighbors came to me, new neighbors came to me and when I pleaded with them about not letting the cats kill lizards, one of them made a huge mistake. She looked at me and said, what good are lizards? She shouldn't have said that to me. I looked her in the eye and I said, what good are you? <laughs> Pianka is not alone in this dim view of the human person. There is now what is known as the Church of Euthanasia. You can Google churchofeuthanasia.org <laughs> and save the planet, kill yourself is their slogan. And they believe in the kind of post-humanism where the planet is more important than human beings. Princeton philosopher and bioethicist Peter Singer maintains that being a human being isn't enough to confer any legal rights. Humans are not ontologically and inher inherently more valuable than animals. He maintains that surely there will be some non-human animals whose lives by any standards are more valuable than the lives of some humans. Singer defends the practice of infanticide, the use of cognitively impaired people for medical experiments. He believes in killing people with dementia. And if you're a parent with dementia, keep their parent away from Singer. He even advocated the sexual use of animals, which according to him are capable of giving consent. Animals have rights too. <laughs> he popularized the term speciesism, which is a derogatory term for the belief that it is all right to treat human beings differently from animals based solely on their being members of the human race. He considers this a form of discrimination. Speciesism is just as bad as racism or sexism. He said to give preference to the life of a being simply because that being is a member of our species will put us in the same position as racists who give preference to those who are members of their race. Singer is widely regarded as the father of the modern animal rights movement. And strident advocates for animal rights are united in their condemnation of speciesism. 
Now, I want to distinguish these people from genuine animal welfare advocates. Ingrid Newkirk, or Peter, or the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals says, astonishingly, there is no rational basis for saying that a human being has special rights. A rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. Animals and humans have equal worth. People who lack uh, uh, that ontological distinctiveness are treated like any other creatures. Now that anti-human sentiment is found not only among atheistic scientists and nihilistic intellectuals, it is also in politics. When God is not acknowledged as the ultimate source and protector of life, liberty and freedom, when he is erased from human consciousness, his laws forgotten, then human life is no longer sacred. Consider the millions of lives that have been enslaved, murdered and sacrificed on the altars of godless ideologies like fascism, Nazism and communism. Advocates and followers of these ideologies have produced some of the most violent and evil tyrants in history who persecuted their own citizens, slaughtered the innocent and brought calamities to other nations. Just look at one example, the Russian Revolution. The Nobel laureate and Orthodox Christian Alexander Zosenison suggests that it was because of the people's forgetfulness of God that the communist revolution was able to enslave, terrorize and murder tens of millions of innocent people. Zosenison says, but if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. An atheistic mentality and a long process of secularization gradually alienated the Russian people from God and his moral laws and this led them away from truth and authentic liberty and led to the rise of tyranny. So when you reject God, humans suffer. Judgment of unnatural passion is our final manifestation in this segment. Corrupted reasoning She's tied up to distorted sexual behavior. Heresy, G.K. Chesterton says, always affects morality, if it is heretical enough. When we jettison biblical authority and orthodoxy, we should not be surprised to find the fudging of moral lines. Three times in Romans 1, in the passage that I read, we are told God gave them over. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. God gave them over. This is God's answer to humanity's idolatrous assertion of self-will. God's characteristic response to intransigent disobedience. Israel will not submit to me, says the Lord. Psalm 81, verse 11 and 12 says, So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. In other words, the penalty for rejecting God is to be handed over to the power of sin. This means that when Paul says, when these people subjected themselves to degrading passions, defined in terms of unnatural sexual relations between people of the same sex, in Romans 1, 26-27, that's a sign of God's wrath and judgment. Sexual relations between people of the same sex, therefore, cannot be celebrated as something good when it is, in fact, a sign of divine judgment. Since the text talks a lot about homosexual relations, it is easy to see how the uh, LGBT agenda has been pushed quite vigorously in the media. Attempts have been made to normalize same-sex relations and to socialize people into accepting this. This is the norm. Uh, LGBT relations are promoted as healthy acceptance of diversity and differences. I'm told that the latest series in the Star Trek franchise called Star Trek Discovery will feature an openly gay couple on the spaceship. And they are doing this in order to acclimatize, as it were, the people into accepting that this is the norm. Now it's important before we leave this section that we don't go away thinking that homosexual acts or sins are somehow more heinous and serious than other sins. The reason Paul highlights it here is so that it may mirror the perversion of idolatry. 
just as the worship of corruptible and created things in idolatry is unnatural in the sense of being contrary to God's plan, so homosexual relations are contrary to what God has planned when he created man and woman. In addition, I want to remind us that in this passage, Paul talks about a whole host of other sins as well. So it's not a case of wanting to just focus on those who are guilty of homosexual perversions. Much has already been written about this, so I, I, I don't want to talk more about the, this, except to remind us that here is yet another manifestation of the rejection of God. Thirdly, my last fact section Moving on, I want to make the case that human flourishing is best when human beings bow to the authority of God. Can we really do away with God's authority? Friedrich Nietzsche was uh, famous for saying God is dead. You know, he wasn't in good health in March of 1883. He was only 39 years old. Largely bedridden that year in Genoa. What happened, what added to, uh, he said, to his uh, black melancholy was the fact that he it had been four weeks since he sent the manuscript for his book to the publisher, and that book was the manuscript was the manuscript for Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And Martin uh, Schmeitzer was the publisher. And Nietzsche has not heard back from him. And it was in that book that he made that famous pronouncement, God is dead. So angered by the delay, Nietzsche fired off a furious letter or complaint to the publisher, which elicited an apologetic reply. It was a month later he found out the real reason for the delay. He said in a letter, the Leipzig printer has shoved the manuscript aside in order to meet a rush order for 500,000 hymnals which had to be delivered in time for Easter. <laughs> now the irony was not lost on Nietzsche. <laughs> God is dead, but that book was delayed because they were busy printing half a million hymnals because people still wanted to sing praise to God. No matter how hard human beings try to do away with God and His authority, they can never erase that innate longing for God. We cannot escape God. That much we know of the human heart from Paul's description in Romans 1. Even the most brilliant secularists cannot live consistently within a thoroughly materialistic worldview. Why? Because God has made us for himself. I think the second thing we need to do in terms of moving forward is for Christians to be critically engaged with ideas. Ideas have consequences. And bad ideas have bad consequences. The terrible murder of millions of Jews by the Nazis and those who were disabled and the Poles and the, the Gypsies as well in the Second World War is but a logical outworking of ideas already in circulation decades before the outbreak of war in Europe. Hitler and his millions were convinced that what they were doing was for the good of the people, for the benefit of humanity. That was the idea that animated their campaign. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, reflecting on his time at Auschwitz, makes that astute observation that modern European thought had paved the way for Nazi atrocities. He wrote, the gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment. Or as the Nazi like to say, of blood and, and soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz uh, Trebinka and uh, Medanet were ultimately prepared, not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. Therefore, Christians can ill afford to be indifferent to ideas and philosophies that are out there in the world, because these ungodly ideas exert enormous influence on our society. And if we are to be sought in light of the world, we have to be actively engaging with this. And it is precisely because of this need that ethos as an institute exists. To help Christians think about their faith in relation to ideas out there in the marketplace. Learn to live along the grain of God's life-giving authority. Instead of it being... Uh, negative in the living out of our lives, 
submitting to God's authority gives a boost. I think we need to go back to the original understanding of the word authority. The meaning in Latin, uh, come the augere, auctor, and auctoritas, they all come from a, a family word, a word family that has a more positive sense of enhancing human life. So, Darrell Gouda, a missiologist, points out that authority has to do with those actions or functions that bring about increase, encourage flourishing, instigate growth. Our word augment is derived from these roots. Thus, authority is that function, that instance, that agency, which brings about increased movement, flourishing, and growth. That's why we need to go with the grain of God's authority. When musicians submit to the authority of the conductor in an orchestra, they become a harmonious part of the music that emerges. This sort of submission to authority is liberating rather than stifling. When we live within the parameters of God's design for optimum human living, we experience what it means to be truly human. We shouldn't be afraid of authority. In fact, Lewis, C.S. Lewis tells us that believing things on authority only means believing them because you have been told them by someone you think trustworthy. 99% of the things you believe are believed on authority. Lewis goes on to say that although he has never seen New York, he believes that there is such a place because reliable people have told him so. By the same token, we believe in the solar system, the circulation of blood in our veins, on authority, on what the scientists tell us. None of us, C.S. Lewis says, has seen the Norman conquest or the defeat of the Armada, yet we couldn't prove them by pure logic. Yet we believe that these things exist. How so? On authority. So if that is true at the human level, then when we talk about what is of ultimate importance, surely the authority of God can be trusted. So let us not be taken in by the serpent's lie that if we have the courage to defy God's word, then we will indeed be like God. The deception in Eden continues. But when we jettison God's authority, that's not the way to freedom, but the way to servitude and death. And I want to say, that the gospel is a form of true humanism. Interestingly, just before that passage in Romans 1.18 that we, we read, we have Romans 1 verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. Salvation is possible because there is power in the gospel to bring that about. God has done something already in the face of the tragic mess that humanity has made of life. And that something is centered in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. So my brothers and my sisters, when we engage in the work of evangelism, when we share the good news of Jesus Christ, we are doing humanistic work. Because we are enabling people to be truly human as God has made human beings to be. So in conclusion, we need to take a step back. Honor Toynbee in his Meditation on Human History says that cultures are healed or changed by creative minorities led by creative leaders and these creative leaders must engage in what Toynbee calls withdrawal return. We need to withdraw to break the spell that society has cast over us and then we can go back with new vision on how to transform that society. There's a sense in, there's a sense in which we are to make a difference in the world we need to take a step back and allow ourselves to be shaped by another word. Not the word from our godless society, but the word of God. And when we look at the world from the perspective of God's word, we will soon see that the heart of the problem is really a heart of disobedience. I think Kierkegaard is finally, uh, in my, my final quote is from Kierkegaard, when he said, people try to persuade us that the objections against Christianity spring from doubt. That is a complete misunderstanding. The objections against Christianity spring from insubordination, the dislike of obedience, rebellion against all authority. As a result, people have hitherto been beating the air in their struggle against objections because they have fought intellectually with doubt instead of fighting morally with rebellion. So behind all the chaotic mess that humanity has made of itself is a fundamental disconnectedness with God. And humanity cannot hope to kill God off without doing massive harm to itself. History has shown the folly of humankind sawing off the branch upon which they sit. 
I think God's heart must be torn asunder when he looks out at the way we have made a mess of the human race. But thanks be to God that his heart is also a heart full of love, amazingly gracious, infinitely patient, and he continues to beckon rebellious humanity to turn from their false gods and to return to him. And on that note of hope and divine forbearance, I shall stop. Thank you very much.